Thank you, Garen, for the uh, introduction. Um, my name is Sarah. I am a PhD student in Ronald Pierik and Saskia van Wezen's labs at Utrecht University in the Netherlands. And it's a real pleasure to meet you all virtually, even though it's a shame that we can't meet in person. Um, but I'm glad to present my PhD work here today. I have been focusing in the last four years about the effect of light quality and especially far red light on uh, tomato susceptibility towards the fungus botrytis scenario. A couple of words about the Netherlands. It's a pretty small country, so the only way we have to grow um, tomato plants efficiently, if I can get my slides right, uh, this is the way we have to do it. So we have to grow all the tomato plants indoors and put a lot of plants per meter square to be able to have a proper yield. So we're pretty good at that. The Dutch greenhouse systems are producing very high yield and they use very low uh, water because the whole what all the water is recycled and we even can control over some diseases and pests by using biocontrols in these greenhouses. The only thing we are not so good at is about energy usage. So we use a lot of energy into lighting, heating, cooling in the summer. And even though those greenhouses are filled with plants, they still emit a lot of CO2 and this is a problem. So this is where I come in and my PhD project was embedded in the Let It Be 50% consortium, which aims to save 50% of energy by replacing the conventional lighting, which are these uh, high pressure sodium lamps with um, LED systems. And the benefit of working with LEDs is that they don't produce any heat. They are very durable and controllable. So you can choose the light quality, the quantity, the direction, and even the color you want. And that makes it a very adaptable system. The only thing that we still are not sure about is how do LEDs actually impact plant growth and resistance to pathogens. So this is where I come in. And um, I cannot really talk about LED lighting be before actually introducing how plants use light in general. So here I represented the sunlight with the visible spectrum for the human eye, which comes from approximately 400 to 800 nanometers. And out of the spectrum, plants are using mostly blue and red light to fuel photosynthesis and actually uh, be able to produce carbohydrates and biomass to develop properly. They also use another wavelength of light, which is called far red. This is not used for photosynthesis, but plants are using the signal to know how surrounded they are by other plants. So this is a comic uh, that I find really interesting to illustrate my point where you have these two seedlings growing next to each other and these uh, red and far red uh, radiation coming from the top. And the comic says that leaf tissue is good at absorbing red light, but not so great at absorbing far red light. So what this tall seedling is doing, it's absorbing the red light to fuel photosynthesis and it will transmit the far red light towards the environment. And as a result, uh, plants in the shade of their neighbors will see more far red light than usual because this tall seedling used the red light. So this is a little bit what happens in the tomato greenhouse, right? When plants are really close together and the lighting is mostly provided from the top, so either from solar light or from these uh, big lamps. But as you go down in the canopy, you can imagine that plants are reflecting a lot of far red light towards each other. So to summarize the idea here, life of a plant in a canopy turns around the ratio between red and far red light. Plants are able to sense changes in red and far red ratio via phytochrome photoreceptors. And these phytochromes can be found in two different forms, either the active form, which is inactivated by far red light radiation, and the inactive form, which is activated either by red light or an extended period of darkness, such as the night, and this is called the dark reversion. So in practice, if a plant is growing alone, it will get approximately equal amounts of red and far red light, which make the ratio pretty high. And in this case, the phytochrome is active and the plant is repressing elongation growth. It's just growing normally. In the case where this plant is surrounded by a lot of other plants, which reflect far red light towards it, the phytochrome will be become inactive and in this case, the plant knows it's surrounded by other plants and will try to outcompete the neighbors for light and elongate, which is called the shade avoidance syndrome. And in this way, the plant can elongate 
and bend their leaf upwards to capture more light from above the canopy. So when plants experience this low red forehead ratio of light, they tend to be more susceptible to pathogens. And I'm going to focus this talk on Botrytis cinerea, which is the causal agent of gray mold. It's a necrotrophic fungus, and it has a very wide host range. And this is what makes it very uncontrollable, is that it can infect many plant species at different stages. So here you see pictures of symptoms of Botrytis, either on fruits or flowers, stems and leaves. And this causes very heavy yield losses in agriculture. A former PhD student of ours actually tested the effect of low red forehead on Arabidopsis resistance towards Botrytis. And she basically found that if plants are illuminated with low red forehead light, there will be more, uh, there will be bigger symptoms on this leaf. So the plants will be more susceptible. So we are um, following the same idea, but going towards um, uh, tomato plants. So we don't use actual high density planting, but we have a way to simulate it. And for that, we simulate the forehead reflection from other plants by adding forehead LEDs into a white light background. So the white light background is our control where the plants are growing very nicely. And with the addition of forehead light, the plant is elongating its stem and the petiole, which is a very uh, typical trait of shade avoidance. When the plant looked like this, so this is after five days that they look like this, we detach the leaflets, place them into petri dishes and uh, drop inoculate those leaflets with botrytis spores and score the lesion after three days. And we place the uh, plates either in white light or in white light with forehead uh, LEDs. So we have four different conditions with either white light pretreatment or forehead pretreatment before infection and white light or forehead light during the infection. And you can see here the lesion area present on these leaflets after three days. And you can see that the lesion area are much bigger on plants that were pretreated with forehead light. And this is irrespective of the light treatment that was given during the infection. So here, what is the most important is the forehead exposure prior to the inoculation. And this is driving the, pheno the phenotype we see uh, susceptible plants. So we decided to investigate this further. Why would the plants be more susceptible if only the light quality is changing? So for that, we selected these uh, two conditions that are highlighted here in green, where the pretreatment light changes and the infection is performed in white light. So we performed the RNA-seq analysis, and this is the setup we used, where plants were either pretreated in white light or white light and far red. And these plants were then either inoculated with a mock solution, which not contained any spores, or with botrytis scenario spores. And after inoculation, we harvested uh, leaf discs uh, every six hours between zero and 30 hours post-inoculation. So I'm going to go a little bit over the analysis. I'm not going to go through everything, but uh, highlight a few things. So when we compare um, infected conditions compared to non-infected condition, which is here, um, this panel here, we see the number of genes that are modulated, either up or down. And we can see that botrytis is uh, triggering uh, gene expression modulation, especially from 12 hours onwards. If we look at what happens in far red, it's a little bit of a different story. So this peak at 12 hours is gone. There is barely any uh, modulation of genes before 24 hours. So this takes way longer for the plants to react in far red when they are challenged by botrytis. And you can also see that the um, overall number of genes is also reduced in, in far red light. So to go to the core regulation of what happens and what triggers the susceptibility under far red light, we selected genes that were modulated by all three parameters that we looked at. So by light, by botrytis infection compared to the mock conditions, and also genes that were modulated through time. Once doing this, we were lucky enough to have 131 genes that fit this criteria. And the most significant category corresponded to response to wounding, and it was composed of six genes. And if we look at the gene expression pattern of these six genes, we can see, so here you see a heat map of these six genes. 
and their expression pattern either in white light over time and in far red light over time. And you can see that they are very much induced at 12 hours in the white light far in the white light treated samples, but completely absent in the far red treated samples. So there is something here that that is um, causing the far red induced susceptibility. These genes uh, all correspond to proteinase inhibitor genes, and those are not new genes. They have been uh, already studied as JA uh, markers. So what we wanted to do next is to actually see whether jasmonic acid uh, signaling was altered in these plants or was modified. And for that, so here there is an example of one out of the six genes. I only put one gene because they behave very similarly um, upon either white light and far red exposure and with and without methyl jasmonate after 15 minutes and four hours. So we could see that the addition of methyl jasmonate could very much induce this gene expression in white light, but in far red, this is a bit like a bit slower. This is a little bit behind. After four hours, however, they tend to catch up. So the gene expression is very similar between white light and far red treated plants upon JA um, um, treatment. So to know if this would have any effect on lesion area, we decided to treat plants that were either exposed to white light or white light plus far red, either in white or red, with increasing amount of methyl jasmonate and measure the lesion area present on these leaves after three days. We can easily see that the resistance is increased upon methyl jasmonate treatment in white light. So the lesion area becomes smaller and this is not happening in far red unless we put the highest amount of methyl jasmonate. So it takes more concentration for the plants to respond when they are exposed to far red uh, light. So this tells us that far red exposure is slowing down the JA response. So it dampens gene, it dampens JA mediated response to the pathogen um, in tomato leaves. So to summarize the idea here, in white light, when botrytis attacks the plant, there is a burst of jasmonic acid that is being produced, and this will lead to resistance either via uh, the induction of proteinase inhibitors or by other um, processes. If FARED comes into play, there will be a uh, effect of FARED on slowing down jasmonic acid responses and therefore reduce the resistance capacity of these plants. Another interesting thing that we saw in the RNA-seq is that far red light is able to downregulate um, cell wall and photosynthesis related processes. So we thought that maybe far red doesn't only affect secondary metabolism, but also primary metabolism. And by diving into literature, we found a paper from Karen Halliday's lab that found in a habidopsis that plants that were mutated in phytochrome photoreceptors, so that are always shade avoiding, accumulated sucrose and glucose in either shoot or roots compared to the wild type. So that's what we tried to do. Um, we had uh, whole plants, three weeks whole plants that we either treated with white light or far red for five days and harvested leaf discs after uh, five days at three o'clock, so when we would normally infect it with the pathogen, to see what is the sugar status when the pathogen comes in. If we look at the total amount of sugars, we can see that far red exposure almost doubles the amount of sugars that is present in the leaves. And if we break that down, so total amount of sugar is actually the combination of glucose, fructose, and sucrose, and we can see that this accumulation in mo is mostly due to an accumulation of glucose and fructose in the leaves. So the next step was to know, okay, would botrytis benefit from higher sugar levels in these leaves? So we know that far it enrich um, tomato leaves in sugars, but does botrytis actually benefit from it? So that's what Emma did, uh, my, uh, my student at the moment. And here is again the lesion area present on these leaves showing that plants are more susceptible to botrytis in far red. And we also try to see if an increased amount of glucose in vitro could promote botrytis growth in vitro. So we measured the, the mycelium diameter and we could see that 
if we augmented the amount of glucose in the place, the pathogen would grow much better. We also tried this with another strain of botrytis, which was isolated from pepper, and we could see very similar things. So we wanted to avoid to have a strain-specific response in this case. We also saw that with other pathogens with uh, different lifestyle and different uh, infection strategies. So the effect of FARAD on sugar um, metabolism is very important and makes it very a very general mechanism. So to really know if this was correlated, we uh, came up with a setup where plants were either treated with white light or FARAD, and after that the leaflets were detached, and the PTO was dipped in a solution either of water or glucose or even DCMU. And we tried to see after 24 hours if this would modulate the leaf soluble sugar levels. And indeed it did. So whenever glucose was added to the plates, we could see a very big increase in especially glucose levels in these leaves. And this was very much correlated with higher lesion area uh, on these leaves after inoculation. So there is a very strong correlation between the amount of sugars in the leaves and uh, the susceptibility phenotype. So this is what I showed you earlier with the jasmonic acid side of the story. And we now know that forehead enrichment triggers soluble sugar accumulation. And this would in turn promote pathogen growth in planta and um, help the pathogen to develop better in this uh, leaves. Um, so the question now is that we saw that as two parallel mechanisms, but are they actually connected? Is there something between jasmonic acid signaling and soluble sugars in plants? So by diving into literature, we found that a paper that works on uh, um, Nicosiana attenuata, and they look at jasmonic acid deficient mutants. So here are the two deficient mutants compared to the wild type. And they saw that if the plants are deficient either in the biosynthesis or the perception of JA, they would um, accumulate glucose and fructose in their leaves. So this is very similar to what we saw. There is no difference in sucrose, but a real difference in glucose and fructose. They also managed to correlate um, the amount of JA and sugars in the plants, and they found out by using different JA mutants that the JA concentrations are negatively correlated to the sugar content in the leaves. So basically, JA, uh, JA levels have a negative effect on soluble sugar levels. What we try to do in our case is to try whether a, a spraying methyl jasmonate on the plants would have the same effect as what they found. So we measured the soluble sugars in moneymaker plants that were either treated with white light or far red and sprayed or not with methyl jasmonate every day for five days. And we see that the addition of methyl jasmonate for five days very much decreased the sugar levels inside the leaves. And that also, um, if we look at the lesion area in a bioassay, we could see that methyl jasmonate would also um, trigger some resistance in white light and not so much in far red. We also tried to study the effect of uh, biosynthesis mutation of JA. So we had the DEF1 mutant, which is mutated in the biosynthesis of JA, and to see whether these plants would have more or less sugars compared to wild type plants. And we can see that the DEF1 mutants had more sugars than the wild type. So that makes sense if JA has a negative impact on sugar accumulation if you remove this, you would have more sugars in the leaves. And that is also correlated with increased susceptibility. What we also did is that since this DEF1 mutant is a biosynthesis mutant, it can maybe not produce JA, but it can very well sense it. So we decided to spray these mutant plants with methyl jasmonate, and we could indeed rescue uh, the sugar levels um, in the plants and also the resistance. So now we know that this is connected, um, where FARAD actually downregulates JA sensitivity and JA is um, um, uh, inhibiting soluble sugar accumulation, and this is then triggering um, um, susceptibility phenotype. 
So to summarize, we show that forehead enrichment promotes tomato susceptibility via a dampening and a slowing of JA-mediated response. So that's why when plants experience forehead, they will have the tendency to respond slower to botrytis. We also found that forehead enrichment enhances glucose and fructose levels in leaves, and that leads to a higher uh, pathogen growth rate in, in, uh, in plants, in leaves. And we also found that this increase in soluble sugars, seem, it seems to be JA mediated. So if forehead promotes soluble sugar accumulation, this can be abolished by exogenous methyl jasmonate. So how do we tackle that in the field, in actually in practice? So what people start doing here now is to implement, forehead, uh, implement LEDs between the rows of crops. And they are actually implementing a combination of red and blue LEDs in order to improve photosynthesis, because this is what plants use for photosynthesis, reduce susceptibility to pathogens, because you would not have such a strong forehead enrichment if you add red light. And we also aim to reduce energy use. So the next time you go to the Netherlands, if you take the plane a little bit in the evening, instead of seeing those very bright yellow patches on the floor, you will start seeing. Uh, these very bright uh, pink greenhouses. This is an actual picture. So on that, I would like to thank the plant ecophysiology group and especially my supervisors, Ronald and Saskia, the students that have been working on this project and especially Sanne and Emma, uh, who's, who have done the most uh, experiments that I showed today, Boston and Kaisa for their help on the RNA-seq analysis, the Let It Be 50% Consortium, of course, uh, and Maud for the amazing illustrations that she did for my thesis, and of course, the funding uh, companies. I would also like to thank you. Uh, you can uh, reach me either on Twitter, by email, if you are interested in what is in the thesis. You can find it either on the Utrecht Library website or in ResearchGate. And if you are more interested in what we do in the group, you can also find more information on our website. And if you have any postdoc vacancies coming at the end of the year, uh, please send them my way. And thank you all for your attention. That's great. So that was such a, a clear talk. Thank you very much, Sarah, for that. Thank and you. let me just reiterate, uh, Sarah is specifically looking to come to the UK to do a postdoc. So if anyone has any positions, please uh, get in contact with her. Okay, so we have a few questions coming in. So the first one is a kind of a general one. So this is from uh, Irfan in New Delhi, actually. So it's good to see people from across the world uh, tuning in. So he asks, um, sugar levels increased under fungal infection. What could be the source for that? Is it breakdown metabolism or is the rate of photosynthesis increased or something else? What do you know about that? Yeah, that's an interesting question. We are, think, we are still thinking about this. Um, we still don't know what, so the question is, why are there more sugars in the leaves, right? Um, yeah. We still don't know, and we are thinking about it. So it can either be that there is more production during the day, so increased photosynthesis activity. There can also be more uh, repartition. So we are only looking at separate leaflets, so we are completely ignoring the whole plant uh, sugar repartition. Um, it can be both. Um, we would still have to measure that, but it was also uh, found in whole plant systems. So it also works on adult plants. Uh, the only thing is that the question is still pending. We, we don't know why there would be more sugars. Mm -hmm. So I would think that um, photosynthesis is um, not per se changed because forehead is not part of the, the far radiation, so I would not think it would change anything. The changes would maybe come from a differential repartition of the sugars. But for that, we would have to look at the entire plant, of course. Okay, so we have a simple question from Elspeth Kolmos. She asks, which wavelength of far red light do you use? So we have far red LEDs, and I think um, it's a peak between 730 and 750. Okay. Um, and they are, we just bought them online. Uh, I mean, this is just the regular far red uh, spectrum. Okay. All right. So a question from um, Estrella uh, Luna Diaz, who's in Birmingham. So uh, she asks, how do you think that the enhanced sugar phenotype that results in susceptibility occurs against biotropes? 
that are regulated by other hormones such as salicylic acid? Yeah, that's a good question. So I was also wondering about this. Um, I showed at first some uh, results from a former PhD student of ours who looked at uh, Arabidopsis uh, in response to botrytis under far red light. And they also saw a downregulation of salicylic acid mediated responses. So there was a downregulation of um, e jasmonic acid and salicylic acid responsive genes under far red. So I would not be surprised that there is also something to do with the effect of far red on down regulating also other hormonal pathways. And together with the increase of soluble sugars, of course, since most of the pathogens benefit from higher sugar levels in the leaves, I would just assume that um, um, this would go the same way. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, there's a qu question from uh, Scott Hayes. Uh, who says really nice talk i agree um and he says of course everyone likes their tomatoes tomatoes to be sweet and juicy are sweeter tomatoes going to inevitably lead to less disease resistance in the fruit in the future uh that's a good question i didn't study su fruit susceptibility but i know that uh growers are very interested in having forehead in their greenhouses because there is a higher call for sugars from fruits. So the fruits will be sweeter if you put them in the far red light. Mm. Um, but I would also assume that they would get more easily targeted by botrytis. That's, mm -hmm. uh, I yeah. So we have yeah. to find a balance between having sweet fruits and having um, uh, more uh, defenses going on. So increase the JA and increase the J-mediated pathways to have more defenses on that side. Mm -hmm. This is the trade-off that we, we have with, yeah. with many things, indeed. We so, have uh, everything. Yeah, a question, indeed. A question from uh, Matt Jones. Uh, so he asks, how does far red light induce changes in sugar accumulation in, sorry, does far red light induce changes in sugar accumulation in JA mutants? He says he might have missed this. I don't think so. So if... If I mean, far red, can you phrase that again? Sorry. Yeah, sorry, sorry. So does far red light induce changes in sugar accumulation in the JA mutants? Um, not really. So that was the surprise that we, um, so maybe I can come back to this slide. Can we still see my screen? Yes, yes, we can. Okay, so if I go back, it was one of the last ones. Um, there was not much difference. So, for example, this is the mutant in white light and the mutant in far red, and there was barely any difference in the sugar level. The only thing is that the mutation causes the sugars to accumulate. Uh, so I would not really think that far red has a true effect on sugar accumulation in these mutants, but this is mostly regulated by JA itself. So the mutation triggers the higher, the higher sugar levels. And Probably in this case, far red is not really um, um, a player in there. And mm. that was also the same in the background. So that could just be a background effect, that, that this particular genotype is not responding to far red in the same way as Moneymaker does. That's also something. Okay. Okay, so let me have a look. So uh, there's a, a general question about uh, from uh, Jinghu Hong, and uh, they ask, is there any impact on any other pathogens that you know? Uh, does far red light have any impact on any other pathogens, uh, viruses, or, or, other, or other bacteria? So for now, we tested ourselves uh, Botrytis, uh, Pseudomonas, uh, and Phytophthora infestans. Mm -hmm. And I know that there is also some work done with herbivores and far red also triggers um, the plants to be more um, susceptible to uh, herbivores as well. So this mm -hmm. is a very, very general, um, very general pathway, actually. So this is true for a lot of pathogens. I would not name them all, but uh, this is true for a lot of pathogens.